All right, so I'm recording this share with Zoom. And what's going on is um, in all my classes, you do not have to show up in the real time to participate in the class. Uh, there are certain things you can only do if you do tune into the live stream. And, but if you miss it, then you can go to my website, which is samsclass.info, and you click the class, this is 160. And down here on the schedule will be the videos. They're on YouTube, they're published, everybody can watch the videos later. And you do not have to be in class to succeed. You don't gain points by attendance. Um, you get points by doing certain tasks. And those tasks are here. There's a discussion board and you have to post a, a uh, something on the discussion board every week, um, although not the first week. They're in the schedule, discussion one, discussion two, and so on. Uh, that's an important issue. The City College actually requires that. And I'm, that's, I haven't done it in previous semesters, but I'm doing it now. They're trying to make sure that we have some kind of meaningful contact with every student every week. So the discussion board is one way to do that. Then there are quizzes, which are in the City College Canvas system, which you should be in. And then you have to write two papers and you have to give two presentations. The presentations are only four minutes long. They can be on any security topic but you must choose your topic by a certain date and then you have to give a presentation and then you have to write a paper, which could be on that topic or a different one. And the point is you should learn how to communicate. You should learn how to communicate orally, presenting something, and you should learn how to communicate in writing. Because the point of this course, this is a management course. Um, this course is talking about what it is to take the responsibility of protecting other people in the world of cybersecurity. And so, for rigor, I'm going through most of this certified information security management certification program where you understand what it is to be a manager of security at a company. But we're also going to talk about um, not government and political issues like privacy um, and cyber warfare and so on. And I have some books that you about this topic here. And there's basically every news every day, the news is full of articles about cyber war, which, and that is another area of interest here. One thing that I have to warn you is if you're used to taking my other classes, those are all highly technical and there's a bunch of hands-on projects where you're doing things on a computer and there are none of them in this class. You can do them as part of your project that you write a paper about, but this is not a hands-on class. This is a management class. So be aware of that. And so there's a grading system down here. And uh, that has the usual stuff. There's quizzes, presentations, papers. The discussions are graded. And then there's a final exam. So there's a bunch of points. And uh, the usual deal. Um, you can't copy other people's work for your term paper or your discussion board comments. It has to be original work. There may be some other way to cheat, which if I come across it, I will not give you points for work you cheat on. Anyway, so. Uh, if you want to add this, everybody should be able to add it. It's not officially full. Uh, let me check to see if I have any chat. All right. All right. During the lecture, feel free to send text chat. Uh, and uh, fair enough. So let me just talk about the first couple of lessons. I'll show you. So on this, the whole schedule for the course is on my homepage here, or on, on the page for this course, which you get by clicking CNET 160 from samsclass.info. So we're going to talk about the first one becoming a CISM, and then cyber war. These are two topics for today. The first one is the one from the textbook. So let me start with that one. And so that's here, there. All right, so let me make this big, that P. Nope, that's not it, just a minute. Nope, all right, there's some way to get there. All right, so uh, a CISM. This is a certificate about halfway up to a CISSP, although some people get both, they're slightly different. These are professional certifications that you can have that uh, are not legally required to hold a job in management, but they're strongly recommended that you have these certificates if you're gonna be hired to be a manager of security at a company. Uh, this is the ISACA one. ISACA is one of the large um, security organizations, sort of like a union guild or something, an organization of professionals that work together to help improve the profession. And they provide the test and rules for this certification. And so we'll talk about the CISM, which is something that you could get if you 
put the effort into studying that book, which we're going to cover for a large portion of this class. So if you have the certification, then you hopefully are more confident in your skills in the world of security, and you should be able to put it on your resume and many people require it for jobs. And if you work as a security consultant at one of the at Deloitte and Touche or one of the other security consultancies, which is a very common uh, middle to beginning area for security professionals, once you have some experience, you often become a consultant, you learn a lot more as a consultant and they love these certifications. They love to have all these letters after your name because it makes it easy for corporate customers to tell whether you're qualified. So anyway, um, so chief executive officers, financial officers, chief technology officers, audit executives, and so on. There's a lot of people that use these things uh, that might benefit from these certifications. And another issue is compliance officers. More of my students have been getting compliance jobs. Compliance is like legal and um, tax auditing. It's making sure that you obey the legal requirements for your profession. And as security becomes more defined and more expected, they're beginning to pass more and more rules so that your company has to pass these uh, audit checklists. So you have to hire an auditor and you have to have a compliance officer to make sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do, not reusing passwords, storing data only on encrypted drives, and so on. You have a long checklist of security things that must be done at a company. All right. So let's see, something weird is happening. There we are. All right. So to become a CISM, um, you have to have five years of experience, three in the CISM job practice areas to get this certification. There are ways to some of that to banish. So many of you, if you're beginners, will not be ready to get the certification yet. And then there's an ethics requirement, as there is for other ones, which basically means you have to act like a professional and not break the law. Then there's an exam, and then you have to, to maintain your certification, you have to fill out forms and prove that you are continuously learning new things. 120 hours every three years, that's pretty normal. The same thing is true for the CISSP, which is the one I have, which is the most famous one. So you register for the exam, pay the fee, pass the exam, then you're certified after you have the work experience, and then you have to maintain it by submitting a, a form every year or so showing that you're doing your training. And uh, all right, and in principle, you can have an ethics violation like a lawyer or a doctor and you would lose your certification. In practice, that doesn't seem to happen much, but it's there. So you should have work experience, at least three years of work experience in three or more of these job practice areas, uh, governance, management, security program development, for information security incident management, which is incident response. And you can substitute two years with a CISA or CISSP or a postgrad degree or one year with things like Security Plus. So, um, all right. So if you've been a college teacher, you can count some of that as experience too, which is nice. And here's the ethics. Uh, you encourage people to comply with standards at your company. You have to perform your duties professionally, don't break the law, and of course, maintain privacy. That's what I was saying earlier, talking about Edward Snowden. In this business, leaking secrets is the worst thing you can do, pretty much, just like a doctor or a lawyer. You are a security officer. You know the flaws of the company. You know the secrets. You have access to the proprietary data. One of the primary responsibilities is to maintain confidentiality of confidential data. It's really bad if you don't do that. All right. And so, of course, you have to know that you are competent. And if you, you, I ask you to do something, you don't know how to do it. You have to be clear about it and say, well, you'll have to outsource that to somebody else. Um, make sure people know what you've done. And you're supposed to help and improve the profession. You're supposed to help others along, uh, talk at conferences, uh, help uh, newcomers along in various ways, help educate people, um, both newcomers and, of course, your customers. That's one thing about this business. People typically hire security professionals because they do not even understand security. And so a lot of what they need is to be educated in what could we do to be more secure? What does that mean? What would be reasonable goals to set? And so on. When I first learned fiber optics, maybe 15 years ago, I was very surprised to learn the same thing. When they say, if you are a fiber optic um, installer, a lot of your job is training your customer. They don't even understand what to ask for. It's not like you have a product and they buy it. They come to you like someone going to a doctor and say, I have a problem and I don't even know what to do about it. So how about you tell me what should be done? 
and then, then install that. And it's the same thing here, largely. So anyway, it costs uh, 600 bucks or more to, to take the uh, exam. So it's probably nothing any of you want to do right away, but this training will prepare you for the role of security. And um, if you are brand new to the world of security, you might want to start with Security Plus, which is seen at 120, which is a general overview, but this might also suit you. This would probably suit you if you are inclined for business or management. Um, all right, and so you apply for this thing, uh, you prove that you have the appropriate work experience, and then continuing education. You uh, submit, this class would count, um, or taking courses at DEF CON and Black Hat would count, uh, and so on. There are many courses out there, and that's one thing, all of us in this business, you, you don't get to rest on your laurels. Everybody has to be constantly learning all the time because security keeps changing really fast. All right, and on many, pretty much any professional activity will count. And there are maintenance fees. All right, and you can lose your certification if you don't complete the continuing education, if you don't pay the fees, or if there is an ethics complaint against you that you fail to resolve, then they can revoke it. All right, now I've got these cahoots, which are worth extra credit. So let me bring them up here. So here's the one for right now. and. It should put, there you are. So go to, um, just a moment, that's right, good. There, so go to kahoot.it on your computer and then enter this number. And I'm gonna turn that down a bit. All right, and I should be able to see who's joined. Um, you are not required to do this, but it's worth extra credit if you score high on these kahoots. So most students like this, it helps keep them from falling asleep. I'm just going to open a text document over here to record the winners. This is CNET 160. Oops. Good. So we have uh, eight people. So we should be able to get more of them in the goats. I'll wait a bit because the top three people get extra credit. So it doesn't make much sense unless there's more than three and we got four. I'll wait a few seconds to see if any more people are coming. Just open a browser and go to kahoot.it. All right, good. I'll wait a few more seconds. Oh, good. People still coming. Okay. If you're still coming, please send me a text in the text chat or something. Oh, good. Looks like we might get everybody. We're up to seven. That's pretty good. I'll wait 10 more seconds and then we'll give up on the last person. Eight, nine, 10. All right. So, wait, that's the wrong one, huh? I'm gonna go back, I've opened the wrong Kahoot. All right, let me try this again. It is this one, ah, good. All right. Okay, try this one. And I know there should be seven people. All right, I'm expecting one more. Well, 
Well, I'll give it 10 more seconds. Ah, there we go. Okay. All right. So what's the organization that puts up the CISM? It's ISACA, all right. ISC squared does the CISSP, all right. Let me just move this out of my way, all right. All right, there we go. So which officer focuses on privacy? As chief privacy officer is a fairly new position in America, although it will probably increase as our privacy laws increase. That's the one. All right. The CEO just focuses on making the company work, chief executive. Their, even security is not their main issue. All right. So how many years of direct experience do you need to get a CISM? Three, all right. I thought those slides said five, but three is apparently the limit. All right. Um, let's go back to the slides, actually, since I was confused by that myself. Three makes more sense because you need five for CISSP, and it ought to be less. But I thought I saw five here, so let's make sure if I can make sense out of this. Yeah, five years. Oh, five years of experience, but only three in the practice areas. Okay, now I understand. So you would you could have two years of something else like general IT tech support or something, but you have to have three in security areas. Okay, good. Now I feel better. All right. So, all right. How many hours of continuing education every three years? One hundred and twenty every three years. Right. Good. Okay, and here's the winners. These people get three points each. Bai will have to tell me who they are if they want their points. Zoe, I think, is a real name. And PSE Jack will also have to tell me, okay, I see someone tell me who they are. I know who you are. Bye. Okay, good. Good. People have sent me real name in the chat, which is fine. Good. So now I have names for people. All right. So let's talk about the other topic for today, which is cyber war. All right. So, and this I got from these other books. This is not part of the, uh, um, is it this one? All right. Someday I'll remember what keystroke starts to show. Anyway, this is from uh, The Shadow War and The Perfect Weapon. So, um, all right. So in 2010, the modern world of cyber war began in the sense that people knew it was happening. We've been having cyber war all along, but it was a secret. To be more clear, it was an open secret in the security community. Everybody who was a security professional would hear rumors telling you that, every, that China was hacking everybody, but we didn't know it for sure. It wasn't public knowledge until January of 2010, because Google, after great concern inside the company and great debate, they decided to expand into China, which was a very difficult decision for them because China had a bunch of restrictions where you have to block certain search results and they had ethical issues, but they did expand into China. And in return, China hacked Google to steal data from them and Google caught them and they felt personally betrayed. Here we are trusting you, partnering with you, making a deal, and then you steal our stuff and hack us. And so they got so angry over Christmas, um, they released this to the world. They announced to the world, China hacked us publicly. And that opened the floodgates for everyone else to admit that China was hacking them too. China had been hacking 
every important American corporation for at least five years at this time, but everybody hid it and didn't admit it publicly because they didn't want their stock price to go down. They didn't want to admit that China had hacked them, but in fact, they were hacking everybody. And so uh, Nandiant issued the first public report about this, creating the advanced resistant threat idea, which was China APT1 was the first advanced resistant threat, which is the Chinese government. And they were hacking American companies to steal uh, personally, uh, to steal um, proprietary information because this is how they planned. It was their public plan. This was the plan to improve the economy of China by stealing proprietary data from America rather than reinventing it there. And it's been extremely successful and it's still going on. So they've been targeting a lot of people, but as you can see, the little squares here are the targets and most of the targets are in America. Um, Chinese primarily stealing data from America. They're also stealing it from a few other countries, but we have most of the technological private data worth stealing and they are stealing it and they are incredibly bold about it. They typically don't bother to use proxies or conceal what they're doing at all. You'll just see the IP addresses taking you directly back to a school right near the military where military um, students and uh, officers are just having a job of hacking American companies from there. And then when you accuse them, they will just boldly lie and say, we didn't do that. You're just making it up. It's, it's very curious. It's, it's the big lie. But anyway, it's a huge effect. And so the question is, what do you want to do about it? Now, you could start a war with China or something, but nobody really wants that. So something that you could possibly do is stop them. And so then you want to understand it. So Lockheed Martin wrote the, the cyber kill chain. And here's one of the many versions of it. Here's what goes on when an advanced persistent threat attacker attacks you, which is basically a foreign government or a very large organized crime syndicate, but it's typically governments. So they define a target. You start at the right. Then you go around here. And let me make this a little smaller so I can point around with my mouse. All right. Just a moment. Here's my zoom. All right. So you, you check, choose your target. Then you get your team to attack them. Then you get tools. And then you research the target. This is a big issue for penetration tests. You... Google the target, uh, analyze their web page, look at the uh, resumes of their employees and the job offers, and you figure out what they're doing and what they're using. Then you start scanning it. Um, you run some kind of test to see how good their ability to detect an attack is. Then you deploy tools on their machine um, and gain some foothold where you've infected some of their machines with remote control software, making them bots. And now you have a command and control center that can control some machines inside their network. Now, then you expand access and obtain credentials. You harvest the credentials. Typically, you start with something like a laptop. You send phishing emails to people and you get somebody inside the company to click on an attachment or something. Then you get control of one laptop. Then you have to find other credentials to move laterally through the network and take over more and more machines. And then you find some kind of data you want to steal. Then you have to sneak that data off the network, which is the step that China failed at with Google. They did all this to Google without getting caught. But when they tried to steal the data and send it back to China, they were detected on the way out. So the uh, defense measure that worked at Google was data loss prevention. They saw their data going out to an unauthorized destination. That was the clue that led them to discover that all this had happened. And then you remain undetected and can maintain persistent network awareness on their network. This is the special feature of the advanced persistent threat. This is the persistent part. Uh, normal hackers, like small time, small criminals, have a smash and grab attack. They want to hack in your company, steal something like credit card numbers and leave, and that's it. Or hit you with ransomware, demand some money, get the money, and then they leave. They have a simple job. But advanced persistent threats want to maintain a permanent connection inside your network and sit like spies and constantly monitor and steal what you're doing for years. And when China hacked Google, they found that they had stalled, installed malware on their machines and they had also installed sleeper malware that would sleep for up to three years before waking up so that you would go through a cleaning process, restore all the machines, test them, monitor the network and decide everything is fine. And then three years later, it'll wake up and you're back under control again. This is what you do when you're a serious military operation. You're not just trying to smash and get money. You're seriously trying to gain long-term visibility into a private network. <coughs> and so that's 
this covering traction remaining undetected is something they really took seriously. So here's the main ABT groups in the world. The equation group is what Kaspersky calls the NSA. The Americans are very powerful in cyberspace, so we are probably the most powerful. But as far as people attacking us, of course, outside America, China is huge. They've got APT-1 and few various others. These are basically Chinese military units. The Iranians are pretty big, North Koreans, and the Russians. And by tradition, they have these colorful names. They call the Chinese ones are sometimes given names with panda in it. The Iranian ones are for some reason called kitten. And the Russian ones are called bear, fancy bear, cozy bear, and so on. Um, all right. So here's the biggest security threat to the United States. The most sophisticated attacks come from Russia. They write the most sophisticated technical malware. And their main attack was interfering with our election, getting Donald Trump elected. And they're fixing to do it again. Um, it is not easy to say to what extent they exactly succeeded in altering the outcome of the election, but they certainly put great effort into propaganda missions to mess with the election. There is no evidence that they actually directly took over voting machines and changed the totals, but they had a huge effect in causing our discourse to become very polarized and in things like voter suppression. China, so the, Russia's primary goal in America is to destabilize our democratic system because they feel like it would be better for them if democracies failed and people would switch to their system. So they do feel like undermining our democracy and just making us fight among ourselves is a positive benefit for them. So it's not even stealing money or anything, it's just disrupting our government is what they believe would benefit them. China wants to steal secrets. They wanna steal technological secrets to improve their factories and their, and their computers and such to make basically Chinese knockoffs of all our commercial products to prompt up their economy. That's their primary activity. So they stole military secrets, fighter jets and so on. Iran has done a lot of attacks. It is pretty hard to understand what their goal is. They really seem to care about YouTube videos, insulting Mohammed, stealing things like the Game of Thrones. They they do these attacks and they cause some damage. It's just a little difficult to understand exactly what their goal is. And North Korea, they have essentially no functioning economy at all. They fund their entire government by money they steal on the internet, largely by hacking cryptocurrency exchanges. And they also sent out the WannaCry attack, which um, was a big one that took down hospitals in the UK and such. So these are the main people that are cybersecurity threats to the US in the cyber war that is raging all around us. And here's, um, so we started in Stuxnet with 2010, we took down the Iranian isotope separators with a cyber attack, the United States and Israel did. This was the first cyber weapon that caused physical destruction of equipment at the other end. And then the Russians attacked Ukraine and the Chinese hacked our OPM and stole all the information about government employees, military and uh, spies. And then um, the Russians attacked Ukraine some more. And then WannaCry came out, the giant ransomware, and not Petya, another one, um, starting the modern world of ransomware. So in the scorecard, as far as doing physical impact, the United States was first in 2009 against Iran. And Russia has come out more recently doing it. Um, then there's wipers that just erase all the data on a machine to hide your tracks. And then DDoS, which is very common. These are common types of attack, and here's a chart of them all. You can see uh, everybody hacks everybody, but the United States is probably the number one target, certainly for China. And here's a timeline of Chinese attacks up through 2013 or so. And you just see many, many attacks, many, many groups um, with different purposes. The Titan rain attack was specifically against Tibetan activists um, for political purposes inside China, but most of these are stealing intellectual property for their economy. And so, like I say, here's the China rule. There's only two kinds of companies in America, the ones that know they've been hacked by the Chinese and the ones who don't know that they've been hacked by the Chinese. They are everywhere. And until quite recently, there was nothing you could buy that would stop them. So everybody was pretty much wide open to these attacks. And in order to deal with it, we've had these greatly improved network security monitoring teams and management, and that's part of what this class is about. Really, all my classes are helping people to work on these modern teams that protect networks from these attacks. It has become, we've had to greatly increase our ability to detect and repel attacks to give companies some ability to resist these attacks. And then there's the Russian cyber attacks. Many of them, they attack NATO 
and uh, many other attacks. And then there's Kaspersky detected red October and uh, they attacked power plants in Ukraine. And we're going to get to the ones that tried to kill people in Saudi Arabia soon, which got me involved in a way. Here's the Iranian attacks. Iran's attacked all sort of different companies for various purposes. And then let's talk about the Saudi Arabia mod. This one was in 2018. And what they did was the Russians attacked their petroleum processing plants, and they tried to turn off the security measures and cause that plant to have some kind of disaster, which would have killed people, and they were detected, and it was stopped. So it was coordinated from Russian Institute, and this is an attack against Aramco, the most, I think, the richest company in the world, or close to it. So uh, it's been stuff from the Shadow War. So uh, the Russians are very bold. One of the amazing things about the Russians is that they do things and they make sure and put their fingerprint on it. So they poison people and when they poison somebody, they don't just poison them, they carefully use a poison that nobody else has, that nobody else would ever use, so it's got a fingerprint on it. This is like the Mexican drug cartels that don't just kill somebody, they then hang them with a sign on their body from a bridge so everybody knows exactly who did it, so they become afraid. And the Russians do this all the time. And so um, they, they did it twice in Britain. They poisoned in 2006, they poisoned a guy in London, and then they did it again in Britain. And in both cases, nothing much happens to them. This is like invading Ukraine, and under a normal U.S. presidential administration, there would have been consequences, but Trump never does anything against Russia. He is a widely, uh, the general belief from the people I've talked to in the government is that they have compromise on Trump. They have a dirty secret. They are blackmailing him, and he never dares to question anything Putin does for this reason. But in any case, he never does. So the United States that used to be a group that resisted Russian ambition has not been. Now, we haven't been very successful, and here we have um, Hillary Clinton bringing a reset button to the Russians to try to era in, bring in a new era of peace and cooperation with the Russians in 2009, but that didn't work. And uh, But now we have a presidency that is very, very subservient to Putin. And so um, this is why there's come up again, it's been in the news continuously since Trump got in, that the US intelligence community finds evidence proving that the Russians are doing something terrible and then nobody wants to tell Trump. And if anybody does tell Trump, you will just be fired. He doesn't wanna hear it, he doesn't wanna believe it. And you learn to just shut up. And if you don't shut up about this, then you get punished. And Mitch McConnell is also considered a Russian access. They called him Moscow Mitch for a while because he was blocking attempts to secure the American electoral process, which is a target of the Russians. And this is continuing to now. And as you know, the big thing in the newspaper now is um, Trump uh, putting his crony in to shut down the U.S. post office and slow it down to prevent people from voting by mail. Uh, and, you know, it, it, he's definitely trying to alter the way we run our election. And they certainly have pretty much prevented all defenses on the election against Russian propaganda. So the current state in America is that our defense against foreign attacks is done by private companies. So Twitter is banning a lot of sock puppet accounts from Russia, and now Facebook is banning a few of them. Facebook was totally cooperating with the Trump campaign and with the Russians to let them purchase data about Facebook users and target people with lies and voter suppression. They were getting money by selling that, that, and they still are trying to continue doing that, but they're beginning to feel such pressure that they're trying to resist it just a little bit. But that is what they do. They sell access to people and advertising and targeted advertising, and they have, Facebook has, Zuckerberg personally believes it's perfectly fine to buy data and then send targeted ads to people which will show them false news to trick them into not voting. He sees that as a perfectly legitimate activity for them to do, but he's beginning to feel the pressure to come up with some way of pretending he's not doing that anyway. Anyway, and so Suxnet was very interesting. Um, when this came out, I was actually on an airplane going to a conference, and in the airplane, I got one of these Suxnet attacks working, and I totally threw away my talk. I landed, and we just talked about that. It used four zero-day attacks, which are the new attacks that against which there is no defense, and so you could put uh, malware on a USB stick, because the isotope separators were air-gapped, which is the one of the strongest military defense measures. You have machines that are not on the internet. They're not on any network. They're separated, and the only way to move data across is to put it on a USB stick and bring it over. So they had to put 
a virus that would spread across computers and infect USB sticks. And then when the USB stick was plugged into the isotope separators, it would detect that and have an effect. And so they used a variety of um, sophisticated techniques to do this. And then it would phone home from the computers and it would then detect when it got on a real a target machine and cause it to run badly and destroy itself. It was extremely effective and it held back the, the Iranian nuclear weapons program for probably a couple of years without a war. So anyway, there's other courses that we're teaching here. Some 126 I'm teaching this semester. This is the technical class about how to write that kind of malware or this is a defensive class, how to analyze that kind of malware, but it's very similar. This is talking about taking apart Windows malware and seeing how it works. Uh, this is instant response, which is more hands-on learning how to use tools like Splunk and GUR and other tools, which enable you to monitor the traffic on a network, detect when it's under attack, and then respond to kick the attackers off. And this is cryptography, which is a little bit of math, although this is really engineering and not math. I'm really not gonna have a mathematical proof for anything. We're just learning how to correctly use cryptography for important tasks, protecting networks, protecting data at storage and at rest, and of course, some cryptocurrency. Uh, we cover the major cryptocurrency systems and set them up on computer networks and see how they work. She'll undercan Bitcoin and Ethereum, which may or may not ultimately have enormous importance in the world of finance, but they are very important in the world of cryptography. The cryptocurrency space is funding most modern developments in cryptography. So anyway, I got some cahoots about that, and that's all I'm going to cover today. So that is this one, which I launched earlier. All right, and so now it's time for these cahoots. All right. I have 10 people now, so I guess I should see at least seven or eight of them here. I'll wait a few more seconds. Well, I'll give it 10 more seconds. Ah, okay. I'll wait a bit longer. Some people are still coming. All right, I'm going to try giving it 10 seconds now. All right. So who hacked Google in 2010? That was China, beginning the modern world of the cyber war that we know about. All right. Which action is not part of the kill chain? Defacing a website is something amateurs do and political activists. It is the opposite of the advanced persistent threat who want to sneak in and hide. They never would do anything to make it obvious that you've been hacked like that. All right. Which nation runs the equation group? That's us. That's what the Russians call us. All right. 
what nation runs fancy bear. That's the Russians, all right. They call them all bears. Okay, which nation leaks the Game of Thrones? That's Iran. I don't quite know what they're thinking of, but they do a lot of things like that. What nation first destroyed hardware with a cyber attack? That's us. We started it. All right. Us and Israel working together. All right. Who tried to kill Saudis with a cyber attack? That was the Russians. All right. Okay, and I've got winners. Let me get my list. Okay, Joseph. Okay. All right, and Zoe again. And that's why again. Good. All right, so I got my winners. All right. So that's all the lecture that I'm planning to do today. Let me just tell you what's going on. Here's the schedule. So, um, that was these two topics. So you should log into the City College Canvas system and read the first couple chapters in the book. You can start taking quizzes. You can post the first discussion. Those are all things that you should do by next week. Although these asterisks are saying you will not get punished until after the ad period because people may still be joining. So I did, we're not gonna punish you for being late until after this ad date. But if you wanna be on, on track, you should have these things done by next week. All right, and Sam, did you say I have a personal connection? Yes, I do. I have a personal connection in the sense that the Saudis got so scared they decided to um, hire Americans to teach it. And they hired me to do some training in cybersecurity there. So I'm, I teach some Saudi Arabian classes now as a result of that. That's all my, that's my only personal connection. But uh, it did make them very, very afraid in Saudi Arabia. And so uh, some companies there started uh, started hiring Americans to come teach them. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, but I'll leave the share going.